Welcome back to Last Rites Gallery's interview series. Joining us today is exhibiting artist Chris Haas. Welcome Chris, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So Chris, I have to start off by asking you, what, what possessed you to actually start working with skulls, and why do you decorate them in the way that you do? Um, the reason that I started decorating skulls was because I had so many from collecting them. Basically, you know, as a child I just started um, collecting skulls. I lived in a real rural area and, you know, it was an abundant thing to do. You know, go out into the, into the woods by the creek and, and I started picking up skulls as a kid and by the time I was actually working on them I had quite a few skulls and um, I started by drawing some of the designs originally throughout the years and then I guess the next natural step for me was to take those designs three-dimensionally, you know, relief. Um, I think I have a natural inclination. I really am drawn to relief and three-dimensional art. And so I think it was just a natural next step for me to take what I was already doing with the drawings and, and kind of bring them out and off the skull. It's almost as if you're taking these overlooked articles and rejuvenating them with a new life and purpose. Is this an important aspect of your work? Yeah, I think it is. And I think that I try to live my life kind of like that, try to make use of everything and um, take things that are abandoned and, you know, maybe considered waste to some people and turn them into something beautiful and it's definitely kind of the way I live my life. And I think that a lot of people want to know how you go about finding these skulls and what do you do to ensure that they're legal to obtain and transform? Uh, the skulls come to me in various forms and uh, fashions. I get a lot of skulls given to me because I live in Colorado. There's an abundance of wildlife there, so deer, elk, coyote, bobcat, mountain lion, all that type of stuff in North American species, I get given to me and they're, you know, there's lots of different places that you can actually go and see skulls and buy them. And then there's other online suppliers that you can buy basically any skull you can think of and they're not allowed to sell anything that would be illegal. And I, you know, Definitely I check the websites to make sure any disclaimers they have and there are, there are laws and you, it's good to know them. You know, I've done a bit of research and I just, you know, make sure that I respectfully don't cross any, any lines that would, you know, take it in a distasteful direction. And I'm sure in your process of finding these skulls, whether on hikes or via friends or stores, you've probably encountered some pretty interesting things. Do you have any stories in particular that you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, I could, I could definitely pick from a few. There's one where uh, I noticed that there was a fresh, freshly um, dead bobcat on the side of the road that had obviously been hit by a car, and the crows were already starting to gather around, and I knew I needed to act quick, and I knew that I had a friend that lived just up the street, and so I went and knocked on his door, and no one came, and I pounded on his door, I saw his car was there, and as he came to the door, sweating, without his shirt off, I realized that he was home for a nooner with his wife. And I had to ask him for an axe to go cut the head off a dead bobcat down the street. And he gladly gave me the axe, and I felt really embarrassed. And that's, out of all my stories, that's the one that kind of, you know, stays with me because <laughs> of the humor aspect. And from the point that you acquire these skulls, what does your process entail from start to finish? Um, definitely varies with each skull when somebody gives me one or if I find one that's that's freshly dead and it's got you know all the the parts on it basically I have to clean the skull which um, I do a boiling process basically with baking soda and water and it loosens all the flesh off and I basically get it completely clean and of you know any odors or anything it's got to be very very clean for me to work with and if there's anything broken or anything like that I have to structurally just um, secure the skull. So basically when I get the skull ready to start working on the art, the first thing I do is I draw all the designs onto one whole side and stencil and um, get all the designs basically put on with pencil. So basically once I get the uh, the drawing, the stencil work on for what I'm gonna, um, the design layout for the skull, I begin with really rough crude shapes of clay but I basically apply soft clay to the skull when that clay dries, it gets glued onto the skull, and then I begin carving, sanding, adding more clay, taking more clay away, a lot of just visually analyzing the skull, making sure all the reference points are, are correct, and 
that's where a lot of the work is for me basically is the clay work you know I do 75 percent of the work is is with carving and, and getting all my shapes established and once I have the shapes established and they're all glued secure um, basically I have to f fill the brain cavity with uh, an epoxy and wood flour mix which wood flour is basically sawdust and I have to s plug all the sinus ports any hole that the skull might have because the epoxy will just completely keep running out. So I fill the skull cavity with the epoxy, it hardens and provides a solid core base for, for mounting to the panels and the, the decorative medallions. And from there once I have the clay, if there's any horns or you know that aren't already there, any horns or anything like that that I fabricate and which I carve out of wood sometimes, sometimes I carve out of bone, clay, different types of um, materials I use for that. I get all those shapes basically intact and I, around each clay piece I go through and I, with a latex mixture, I actually caulk each piece of clay down to the skull smooth. And from there it starts, uh, I guess I do the eye sockets, which the eye sockets most, if it's not a primate, it doesn't have a pocket for an eye socket, so I have to form one out of an air dry modeling foam that I use. And from there, once I get the eye sockets in place, glued in, everything's solid on the skull, before I do the eyes, I do the paint. And I start with uh, solid black, basically every skull, every piece starts with solid black. And from there I just bring it up in, in tone with a dry brush effect, basically pouncing all the paint I can off of my brush and just, you know, fastly, quickly you know, running over the black and, and raising you know, and as I with each coat, I get a little lighter in color, and to where it's all the brightness is on top. And then sometimes I go in with darker washes and and other colors after that. Um, and after all the paint work is done, then I install the eyes, which are um, a lot of times custom glass eyes, taxidermy eyes. So with the eyes, after I get the eye socket in place, um, I start with a glass eye lens that I form uh, basically a foam eyeball, so it has a form to fit in. Once the eyeball is in, in place, I go in with, um, I was using chamois leather for a long time, but now I'm using recycled leather jacket leather, um, which there's an abundance of at thrift stores. Old thin leather jackets work really good. And that's what the eyelids are made out of leather. Get them all in place, more clay, epoxy. Um, I, I do a lot of detail on the eyelid, just combing in texture. And, uh, and once that's done, you know, the skull, if there's, uh, a jewelry adornment applique, I do that very last and then it gets mounted to the uh, medallion panel pieces are a total process of themselves. They're a combination of found object and woodwork and there's an extensive amount of work that goes into the, to the decorative medallions as well. You can definitely see all those steps in your pieces. Um, I'm wondering how long each one does take you to make. Um, each one takes you know a different amount of time depending on size and um, just how much involvement the design has in it. And sometimes a smaller piece can actually take me a lot longer because it's so small. It, I have to work more with tools as opposed to my actual fingers. So it varies, but I would say anywhere from you know six to eight weeks is is you know I usually work on several pieces at a time, so it's kind of hard for me to tell exactly how long they take, but. I, I wouldn't want them to take any less time than that. I definitely feel rushed. And what are your ideal working conditions? Um, it's really great if the sun's shining, but it's really hard to not get distracted. And so I found out that working at night is ideal for me. No one messes with me. And so I just light the hell out of my studio and I like, you know, hard, heavy music and uh, really just to kind of be left alone and not messed with. That's ideal for me. And what do you find to be the most rewarding aspect of your creative process? Um, the most rewarding aspect to me is the privilege to work with these skulls because they're such beautiful works of art before I even touch them. You know, I spend, I usually spend a couple of weeks with a skull admiring it and, and following the lines and getting to know it. and just it's a great honor and privilege to be able to use these bony leftovers of, of nature as my canvas. My intentions when I work on these skulls are to 
work with the existing forms of the skull and to accentuate the natural lines that are already there and to adorn the skull respectfully and you know I look in the future into maybe working more with transforming them but right now I think my, my real intention and message is you know to, to naturally flow with something that already exists in nature you know it's a combination of man-made and, and natural fusion and I think that there's a a graceful line that you have to kind of balance on to not disrespect that reward. Each piece has a name rather than a title, and this further personifies these pieces and gives them more of a personality. How do you decide to name them rather than give them a title or a saying? They kind of come to me for the most part, and there are certain ones that are relevant to the species. Um, I'll kind of play off the, the species or or the color, you know, um, but really they kind of just come to me, you know, when when I look at one, and I I'll, sometimes I'll come up with a few names that aren't right, and I know that they're not right, but then when I hit the right one, I'm like, yep, you're Gil, that's who you are. And Waking the Dead is Chris's first solo exhibition here at Last Rites. Did you do anything special to this body of work in lieu of showing at a dark art gallery? The one thing specifically, beyond just really trying to push everything to the level that I see Last Rites being at, you know, which was a level that I'm basically, you know, still trying to get to, even though I'm here. Um, but the one thing for, I, I would say, I guess for Paul, more than anything, is I really wanted to have something with curved goat horns, and so that's why I did the green uh, ram crusher, and yeah, I felt I felt really strongly about that. I was, I was, I was determined to get a piece with curved horns for the show at Last Rides, for sure, absolutely. We well, can imagine these pieces actually speaking to you as you create them. Do you find that you're having a conversation with them as they evolve? I do, I do, and some are better than others. Um, I did a, a canine skull that I put a set of human eyes in, and it sat flat on one of my work surfaces for quite a few weeks and every time I walked past I swear it was giving me the look like you gonna throw the frisbee? Where's the frisbee? Yeah, you got a ball? You got a cookie? <laughs> like it just it was the dog skull and had eyes and it was looking at me so it's really hard once you put eyes in something that's when they come to life and that's when you do feel they're personified and they could possibly have a voice and, and talk to you and when you work a lot of hours alone in your studio something's gonna start talking to you so it's surely to be the things with eyes that will start talking first. Another, another interesting aspect of your work is the color palette that you choose for each skull. What influences you to choose the colors that you do? I think I'm, you know, really drawn to prismatic electric colors. Um, as much as I like love dark art and black and, and gray and charcoal being some of my favorite colors as well. I feel like with the skulls, the, the prismatic colors really electrify, electrify and bring them alive. And sometimes I'll have a piece of jewelry that I'll even be working towards. If it has a certain color of stone in it, I'll go with that. Um, a lot of times, you know, the, the skull will kind of just speak to me in a way that I can, you know, I picture it being a certain color. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I, f I find things best when I'm not looking for them. I feel like most of the things just kind of come to me. You know, I don't feel like I really come up with them. Another distinct aspect of your skulls is the head jewelry. On some of them, not all, but some, there are some stones and um, jewelry work around each piece. Mm -hmm. Why do you decide to give some these head adornments and not the others? Um, once again, it's, it's kind of just what, what speaks to me. Certain skulls definitely allow themselves much better uh, they lend themselves much better canvas flat on the forehead to uh, to an applique. Other skulls, like canines, curve in on the bridge of the nose, to where they don't. They're not designed as well for a piece like that. But I'm definitely into incorporating the jewelry and and the whole third eye um, symbolism is obviously a repeating theme in in my work and probably always will be. I'm drawn to it. I'm not sure why. If it's if it's the DMT that's stored behind your third eye, or, or what, but I'm definitely drawn to it. 
When looking at your exhibition, I seem to connect very well with Gerard, as if there's some kind of emotional story or background behind him. What influenced you to create this piece? Do you have any details that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Gerard has actually had quite a journey. He, for many years, um, hung on the wall of a good friend of mine's parents' little shanty cabin in southwest Colorado, and uh, I think it meant a lot to her to give me the skull because it was hers. It was she's kind of a just a very earthly woman. I think it meant a lot to her to have that skull. It was from her land, and so it meant a lot to me that she gave it to me. And to work that piece into a piece of art, and then to bring it all the way here to New York City from such meek beginnings, and you know, it's I think that it's it's pretty symbolic of maybe where I'm coming from and where I'm trying to, to go to as well, you know, if, if that kind of falls along those lines. And who's to say where he'll go next and what That's other right. journeys he will follow Gerard. I gave him a French name, so perhaps he'll be France bound. <laughs> Another question is, have you ever considered using human skulls? Paul's actually very interested in acquiring one. I'd love to, especially for Paul. Um, I haven't gotten to the point to where I've had a human skull. I worked on one that was just resin. Um, the only reason I haven't done one yet, I think, is because I haven't acquired one. But I would love to be uh, have the first one that I do for be for Paul. That's for sure. We reached out to some fans to see if they had any questions for you. One of which asks, "How do you go about acquiring the eyes for each of your skulls?" Um, the eyes are all taxidermy eyes, and Sometimes I use stock eyes. There are eyes available for almost every species of animal on the planet, but I really like custom. And so what I do, I basically draw my own eye designs and I send them to the glass eye lady, Teresa, in South Dakota. And she never really asks me any questions why I want a set of yellow and purple coyote eyes. And she just makes them and sends them and they do a great job. And um, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I have that ability to think up an idea and have someone on my team that can help me make it come true. So. And here's our favorite question, our Paul Booth question. If you can dig up any artist to consume their brains for their artistic power, who would it be? That's a completely unfair question because Paul is still alive. I know that he'd notice if I started eating his brains, <laughs> but if I get a chance later I might just try a little nibble. <laughs> Well, Chris, thank you again for being here today. I think that everyone is a lot more familiar now with your process and all the heart and soul that goes into these pieces to give them their second place on Earth. Thank you for having me.